Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Friday night interview with Sister Stacy Cook. Uh, if you haven't seen these interviews uh, that I've been doing on Friday nights, uh, I do have a playlist uh, where I've collected, I don't know how many I've done now, uh, probably 10 or 15 or more. Uh, and it's my goal to interview uh, all of the saints who are, are regular participants in our congregation. And now I'm very fortunate to have Sister Stacy Cook with us tonight. So, uh, hello. So, yes, say hi to everybody. Just give a give a little brief introduction, if you if you will. Okay. Hello, saints. God bless everyone tonight. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, I know that some people are going to be watching the live program, and some people will watch it later. So we'll keep that in mind. That. Uh, 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 in the in the chat room, if we get any interaction in there and people have questions, well, we'll try to respond to your your thoughts and your questions as we go along. Uh, but uh, for now, Stacy, um, I just learned your age, and, and uh, I you know it's not po really polite, I guess, to ask a, a a lady her age, but I got that out of you. I don't know if you want to divulge that to the public or not. But, uh, oh, no, I'm totally fine with it. I'll be 52 in February. 52, yes. What do you think of that, everybody? Yeah. She, uh, doesn't she sound much younger than 52? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that makes my thing. <laughs> yeah, now, I, um, do you uh, mind telling uh, everybody uh, where you live? I don't mean your address, but your, your state, at least, if not the city. Yes, I live in Gilbert, Arizona. It's about 30 minutes south of Phoenix. Okay. Yeah, near Phoenix. Okay, I've been to Phoenix. Of course, living in Las Vegas, you know, I, yes. um, I've been there a few times over the years. And uh, Phoenix is very similar to Las Vegas. You say it's how far away from, from Phoenix, Gilbert? Uh, about, about 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, depending on traffic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you got Mesa and Scottsdale uh, nearby, but I uh, uh, and Tempe, uh, I guess they're all pretty close to Phoenix, I think. But I've never heard of Gilbert. Yeah. Gilbert is that is that uh, a, a fairly small uh, it, like suburb or what? It's well, it's called the East Valley. So you have um, Tempe, Ahwatukee, Mesa, and Chandler. They're kind of all near each other. So mm -hmm. you know, it's combined. It's kind of called the East Valley area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, were you also born and raised there, or how long have you lived in uh, Arizona now? No, I was born in Springerville, Arizona, which is kind of north of where I am now, and that's central eastern part of Arizona. So it's called the White Mountain area. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the weather's a lot colder up there. Yeah, it, would that be more like the Flagstaff area? Yeah, it's it's kind of on the other side of Flagstaff, but the weather is very similar as Flagstaff. Yeah. So I yeah. was born there, and um, I lived there up until my mom and dad separated. I was about three, oh, me wow. and my brother. And then my mom left and with me and went to California, and then I lived there for quite a while. Okay. And then for about 20 years. And then I kind of went back when I was a teenager and stayed with my dad and went to school for a while. But I was kind of back and forth. And I met my husband that I'm with now. I've been with him 26 years. So I met him in California. And then he got transferred to Arizona for a job. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Uh, Stacy, uh, good night. Interview's over now. <laughs> <laughs> You just told me your whole life story, and no, I don't need to ask any questions now. <laughs> I, I do that. I wanted to tell you when you call that I get ahead of myself, so just let me know because I have a tendency I'm to get gonna, ahead of myself. I, I'm going to back up and retrace all your steps there very carefully. But, uh, okay, so let's go back to this uh, 50, almost 52 years ago in, in – uh, Born in Arizona, and uh, in, in you say that, uh, now did you have a, a two-parent family? 
Yeah, well, my mom and dad got married really young. I think they were 18 and 19. And they, you know, they separated. I don't know. They were together a few years and then they separated and divorced. But I just think, frankly, they were probably both too young. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, I want to I want to just ask uh, anybody in the chat room. Uh, hey, Celine and uh, Leo. Uh, I uh, just give me any feedback. I, I have the telephone on uh, speaker, and I, I've got it near my microphone for uh, this. And I just want to know if the audio is okay. I don't expect it to be as great as uh, otherwise, but um, if 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 the audio is not okay, somebody in the chat room let me know. Okay, I'm going to assume it's all right then. Uh, um, so. Uh, I, I, I missed a little bit because I was distracted by the chat room and my question there about your the two parent family. Uh, you yeah. You're, you said that they uh, uh, they got married and were you the first to have one? Do you have any siblings? I have an older brother. He's six years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so you're now. You said something about uh, uh, I think a divorce or something, but your parents were. You, you did have a, let's call it a normal. Isn't it weird that I have to even ask such questions? That no, no, it's, no, it's not. Um, no, I didn't really have a normal childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a rough childhood. But looking back now as I've gotten older, I'm thankful because I think I learned a lot. And God used everything that I've been through for his purpose. So it's. You know, being 50, looking back, I, I understand. I understand a lot of what I went through was for his purpose. Well, I'm, I'm uh, asking you the question of, um, about is it strange to ask that kind of a question? Because not, not about you personally, but, but just the question in general about our society today. Yeah. Uh, it's, it used to be yeah. that um, you'd always just assume that people from a two-parent family and your parents were stayed together and you, you grew up like that. And, and now it's not safe to assume that. It, you could very well have had a one-parent family or some type, point of a breakup and people are not committed to their marriages and their, their family uh, today as they used to be. So uh, no. now, okay, so you have a brother that's six years older than you. So when you were born, I, you know, you had the advantage of having a sibling and in that relationship, but uh, tell me about your a little bit about your parents and uh, okay. how you were brought up. Were 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 they Christians of any kind? And did you have any kind of no. Christian upbringing? Nothing. No, my dad in Springerville. I want to say it's about eighty percent Mormon and maybe twenty percent Catholic, and then somewhere in between. So I grew up. I have a lot of Mormon family. Um, I never really bought into Mormonism. Um, I think some of that is because I lived a lot of my time in California, so I wasn't really around my big Mormon family that much. And, you know, I want to start off saying they're wonderful people. They really are, but I just don't agree with their their doctrine. Yeah. I, I have a lot of disagreements with that, but I do. I come from a big Mormon family. Um, and so when my mom left my dad, that was a big stir up and she, my dad, I think actually got custody of me. Um, as you can imagine, 50 years ago, that was really hard for the dad to get custody, but being in a little Mormon town, you know, you know, everybody, <laughs> so, uh, I think that, you know, it was just, it was, my mom wanted to be in the city and my dad was a country, you know, he's a country guy and there was no taking the country out of him. Mm -hmm. And so that caused problems in the marriage. And when my dad, well, my dad got custody and then my mom took me and fled to California. And so she left my brother in Springerville, Arizona, and then she took me, I think I was three, and then left to California. And that a big stir up in the family, <laughs> as you can imagine. Well, that that brings me to since you're talking about the age of three and 
you're you're uh, recalling these events at that time. Uh, I, I like to ask everybody this question. Uh, and I'm just very curious, and that is that what is the earliest memory of your entire life? Wow. You know, for some reason, I, I want to say with my dad, I think the earliest memory is him making ice cream from snow. <laughs> hmm. I, don't, I don't know why I remember that. And then with my mom, I want to say playing on the beach, you know, because I was in California when I was young, and, and I remember just playing on the beach. Well, uh, so at, what age, at what age did those uh, things take place? Gosh, you know, I really, I'm not sure if I'm really accurate, but I want to say probably around five. Uh-huh. Okay. Somewhere around there, maybe five and six. I, uh, I try to ask everybody that question. Sometimes I forget, but it's just, I'm just always curious because I think back at my life and my earliest memory was about five or six years old. I was in kindergarten and I, I remember yeah. kindergarten very well. For some reason, kindergarten was a wonderful experience that that time was very enjoyable. And I, there's events in kindergarten that you know are very memorable, but I can't remember yeah. anything uh, uh, clearly before that at all. So in your case, it's yeah. roughly about the same age, but I, I've had some people tell me they remember things even as early as two years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, not me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, okay. So uh, I want to, your, I can't remember if you said your father was Mormon or both of your parents were Mormon. My dad was Mormon. And then my mom was, we were out in California. I think she got into the New Age stuff a little bit, so she kind of dabbled mm -hmm. in that for a few years. Okay, uh, but do you remember your father uh, giving you any instruction in Mormonism as a child? No, and my dad really did it. I, I think he kind of fought the Mormonism, or he just wasn't a practicing Mormon, you oh, know. Okay. Um, but but the rest of the family was. So my brother and my dad's parents, they were all practicing Mormons. And I think my dad was into Mormonism when he was younger, but as he had me and my brother, I can't really remember him being a practicing Mormon. Did, did your, your father, I guess then, did not uh, advance in Mormonism to the extent that he no. actually went on a Mormon mission the way that they normally do. Right. And I remember my mom talking about it, that, you know, his mother wanted him to go on a, a mission, and they wanted him to, you know, serve, uh, serve in the priestlyhood and, and all of that, and, you know, be a bishop. But I, I think he really fought it, you mm -hmm. know. And also, he was an alcoholic. He was got pretty extreme into alcoholism the last, I want to say, 30 years of his life. So he really struggled with that. Hmm. He was, yeah, he was, a, he was an alcoholic for a good, I want to say 40 years. Okay. So you, uh, you, you grew up uh, in a Mormon environment in terms of the town was uh, mostly Mormon yeah. and you had some yeah. family and friends. Uh, uh, you, did your brother uh, take it seriously too and go on a mission? No, he didn't. Um, and, you know, I know he's talked a little bit here and there about Mormonism. You know, he always sticks up for Mormonism. I don't want to say always, but he'll tend to stick up for it. But I've never really seen him really give in to it wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting. You know, I, you know, I was born and raised in Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is also – well, not as much anymore since we've got people from all over the world who've moved here over the years. But uh, yeah. when I was growing up, this was a Mormon town. It was settled by Mormons, and it was, yeah. a, it was a railroad town and a Mormon settlement. And so many of the people, particularly the prominent people who you know owned a lot of Vegas and had uh, either the uh, um, they were in charge of the local politics and stuff. It was it was all uh, the Mormon. Uh, 
uh, leaders in Mormonism. And so uh, I've been around it a lot, and we have a term, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's called a Jack Mormon. Yes. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> yes, it, I heard a lot of that when I was in high school, you know, being in high school. Are you a Jack Mormon? You know, I heard of that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, for those of you who uh, are listening and uh, if you you're not familiar with the term. It's a Mormon that is, uh, it's much like a, a Christian that doesn't really take their Christianity seriously and they don't tr try to be practice their, their uh, Christianity anyway, like maybe attending church yeah. or reading the Bible or anything. They're a Christian by name only, but, but they don't really try to uh, follow any of the tenets of it. And that's what we'd call a Jack Mormon. And I knew a lot of those. Uh, and then at some point, yeah. some of them I know that they were Jack Mormons early. And then later in life, they got it serious and became serious Mormons. So, uh, yeah. if you're if you're living in a town like that, and as you're if you yeah. stay in that town long enough, uh, you you may either develop an interest in it, uh, or you may feel like you need to conform to it to get ahead. Yeah, <laughs> isn't yeah. that crazy? Because you know all of no, the. No, it, it is true, and you know when you become a Mormon, it's really hard if you're going to leave the church i want to say it's almost hard to come out of it because uh there's just a lot of condemnation um they just uh they will continue to track you down <laughs> yeah i would say that uh 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 islam mormonism and jehovah's witnesses they are all uh, very seriously uh, uh, shun those people who lose leave their faith. Uh, yeah. even, even their own the closest family members, if they dare to leave, they get they get shunned. And uh, yes. Yeah. So. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it's hard if you're practicing Mormon. You want to come out of that. You have a big Mormon family. Mm -hmm. um, that can be difficult for people. Because you're not just leaving the church, you're leaving the family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about your uh, your your childhood now. Uh, what what event happened at the age of three again that you mentioned? Well, I you know you were asking two events that I remember, and it, I would say the earliest for some reason I re remember my dad making ice cream out of snow, and and I remember being in California with my mom playing on the ocean, playing on the beach. Okay. Uh, I thought, I, I, maybe I misunderstood. I thought that there was a breakup oh. when you were three years old. Yeah. Were, okay. Well, I think my mom left and went to California, I want to say when I was about three. So she took me when I was about three and we mm -hmm. moved to California. Mm -hmm. This was when she left my dad. Yeah. So when you first went yeah. to California at the age of three, you can't probably recall much, if at all, any, any of that then. No, I, you know, I just remember we moved around a lot. I didn't really question why I wasn't around my dad more, because during that time, I didn't see my dad until I was a teenager. So mm -hmm. for some reason, I never really questioned it. I just mm -hmm. kind of thought it was normal. <laughs> So but, at, 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 what, know, yeah, at what age did your, your father get custody of you? Um, I want to say when I was about three, right before we moved. Okay. And, you know, as you yeah. said, that's very rare um, at that time. Uh, today, it's more, yeah. more, it's more possible that a, the man could get custody. But back then, it was, it was very rare. Uh, was there something yeah. that would make the judge feel that you're, for some reason, your um, mother should not have custody? Well, I think my mom was young, and she just didn't want to be married. And my dad's family knew everybody in the town. You know, it was a big Mormon family. So I think that probably had some benefit for my dad. He, I mean, honestly, he probably knew the judge, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think, you know, things were just different than 50 years ago. Yeah, you'd probably have to have a judge, uh, either your friend or your, your the judges in your family, to, to uh, yeah. at that time give the the, the man the custody. Yeah. Um, so yeah. then you got uh, when you got custody, you came back to Arizona, and and uh, uh, now uh, 
growing up, what, what kind of interests and, and activities did you have as a, as a young girl? Well, you know, I, I loved animals. I played softball for a while, and I just loved being around my friends, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you make a lot I of did, friends? Um, not really. I was always pretty shy, and I think it's because we moved around so much. Um, I, I'm more of an introvert. God kind of had to work on that with me, but yeah, I've always been on the shyer side. Hmm. And you're still, are you still uh, pretty shy? Would you? I've, I've gotten better. No, I'm not as shy now. Mm -hmm. It's been a process. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you develop any uh, interests uh, besides your friends? Like uh, in, you said you played softball, but any hobbies or did you, uh, was it sports or uh like art or music or anything like that you got an no. interest in or like, not you know. really no uh -uh. all right and what was uh, what was it like when you're going through uh, uh high school and uh, did you did you develop the normal interests in, in boys at that time yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure <laughs> 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 Well, high school, of course, junior high and high school can be a very difficult time for, for kids. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was hard on me because we did a lot of moving, you know. It just, I didn't really have a stable childhood, so um, it was just, you know, didn't really make the connection with friends too long. What's the uh, what's the uh, oldest friendship that you have uh, that's, that's still uh, current? Well, I have a couple of friends that I've kept in contact with for about, oh, good 30 years, you know? Hmm. Uh, yeah, or, you know, I don't see you've them very them, often. You've known them for three years now? No, I, I, I've kept in contact with um, a couple of girls I went to high school with. Probably mm -hmm. it's been about 30 years. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious about that. My wife still has quite a few friends that go back even to her childhood. Um, she grew up in Connecticut, and of course, she's lived in Las Vegas now for uh, about 39 years. But uh, she's about my age. But wow. uh, so she spent like half her life in Connecticut and half her life in Las Vegas. But she still got quite a few close friends that were friends from her youth, and uh, I would. I'm always wondering wow. how many people have friendships that old because uh, yeah. most most of my friendships were back then. I can't even find them. They're probably dead. I know some went to prison, some are dead, and some of them I can't find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the um, uh, what what uh, then when you go to high school, did you have any uh, uh, desires in terms of wanting to uh, grow up and get married and have a family, or did you want to get well, into a career, or a particular line of study or anything like that? I got married when I was 18 to my first husband, and that didn't work out too well. Huh. Um, well, that's, yeah. that's probably, so, uh, the very chances are pretty, uh, not very good for it to work out when you're 18, but my first wife, <laughs> my first wife was 18 also. Um, Really? Yeah. 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 We were, I was 18. He was a little bit older, but we had our um, first two boys together. And he, he just, he was in and out of trouble. And I decided that wasn't the kind of life I wanted with my two boys. And so I left and I took the boys and that started, that started problems. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was young. So I was married to him for three years, and then I left with my kids and got a divorce. And then the um, I've been married to my second husband now for about 26 years. And he's amazing. He's a good guy. And, and they said, he, and they, and they said yeah. it wouldn't last. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah. everybody kind of wondered, is this going to work out? But, yeah. yeah, he's a good guy very responsible so he kind of took my first two boys in you know he considered them his really you know he took them in and took care of them 
And then my two older boys would go and stay with their dad in the summers, and then we'd have them during the school year. Let's pause and so. say, let's pause and say hi to people in the chat room here for a moment here. And, uh, okay. And let me see. Okay. We got uh, um, now. I, I'm seeing Stacy Ann in Arizona, but. Uh, and you're, you're Stacy Cook, but is this a different Stacy? Yeah, that, is that you? That's a different Stacy. Yeah, there's no, there's a Stacy Ann in Arizona. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, Stacy Ann in Arizona, uh, I want you to meet Stacy Cook in Arizona. <laughs> 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 and uh, let's say hi. To, let's say hi to uh, Sister Carol and uh, Anna. Uh, uh, right. Jay Money. I, I don't I don't know who Jay Money is. Uh, I'm sorry if you've been there before and I didn't uh, acknowledge you, but uh, if it's your first time, I want to make sure you feel welcome. And uh, uh, what we what we do on Friday nights is interview all the different members of the congregation, and gradually, uh, maybe eventually, I'll be able to interview all of them. And Jay Money, if you if you stay around long enough and are a regular participant, then I'll eventually get around to interviewing you too. We've got Brother Leo Larson and. Uh, uh, of course, Sister Celine. And uh, okay, so um, looks like the chat room is pretty peaceful. If we do happen to get any troublemakers in there, uh, anybody who does have the, the moderator wrench, uh, please uh, let's have zero tolerance for bad behavior. Uh, and thank, thank you for your help with that. But uh, I think it may be, we may have a peaceful night. Uh, uh, good. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, this time, so you're you got married at eighteen. You had two children yeah. with him, and and then yeah. left left at uh, twenty one, three years later. And, and then what yeah. what were what did you do after that? Did you uh, were, did you go into the workforce or go to school or get remarried I, right away or what? Yeah, I, I went back and to California. I stayed with my mom for a while and kind of got my act together and went went back to school. And then mm. I said, well, I'm never going to get married again. <laughs> and uh, then I met my husband that I've been with now for 26 years, and he's just amazing. Um, I really feel like God's put him in my life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I got to apologize, um, sister. I got distracted by a comment in the chat room from Anna. Uh, no, she was, that's she okay. Was, she was, said she was in the ER all night. And uh, needs our prayers. So everybody, uh, okay. let's let's put Sister Anna in our prayers and uh, ask the Lord to help her with, and heal her and help her with whatever this problem yeah. is. I know I also see uh, uh, Brother Alex in there. And I know he he needs our prayers now too. For uh, um, I don't know. I, I think maybe you have to be relocated or something. I don't know, brother, exactly what it is. But I'm praying for you, Brother Alex. And uh, okay, um, so um, how long? How much time passed from uh, you leaving your first husband to um, meeting and and getting remarried? Oh, geez, maybe four years, five years at the most. So, well, and and your first husband, yeah. when you left him, uh, did he have any kind of involvement with you and the, the, the children, you know, like support or interaction at all, or were you yeah. completely on your own, or what? Yeah, he was. He was more on the abusive side. So we, my my husband and I, we struggled with him for a good. I want to say 10, 10 years. Um, you know, it, God really had to work with me on forgiveness. You know, I had to come to the point that where I was just ready to forgive. Because we really, I really struggled with him for, like I said, a good 12 years. He just, he wasn't applicable, you know, if I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't able to just try to compromise and do what was best for our children. You know, he's hanging on to resentment and he kind of had this attitude, if he couldn't have me, nobody could. Mm -hmm. So he was going to make my life miserable, and he was going to make my li my new husband's life miserable. Hmm. So, you know, and he and just put us that, through a lot. How was your uh, your children's relationship with with him? 
Well, you know, he was he was good to his boys when he had them. The problem was is they would come home during the school year, and, you know, I had to set the boundaries again. You know how that goes. They're gone all summer, and then they come home, and they got to go back to school. So we struggled with that. But, you know, I don't feel like he abused his kids. Um, it just... He wasn't compromising with us too much, so it made things hard. <laughs> so you had the two boys, and now how many children have you had all together? Okay, so me and my husband, I had the two boys with him, and then me and my husband that I'm with now, we've had three kids. Three, so five all together. And uh, yeah. so uh, uh, at least the first two are, are grown up, and uh, I hope by their independent, uh, successful, independent yeah. people. They're, our oldest is 30, and then the second oldest is, well, wait a minute, the oldest is 31, and then the second oldest is 30. So I had them a year apart. Mm -hmm. And then my husband and I now have a 26 year old together an 18-year-old together, and a 12-year-old together. Uh -huh. So a 12-year-old, and, and what was the one, the one just before that? The, the oldest is 31, and our youngest is 12. Younger, and what's the middle one? And the middle one, well, would be our daughter. She's 18. Okay, so you, have, you still have two living at home then? Yes, okay. I have two at home. Our youngest is 12, and then our daughter's graduating mm -hmm. in May. Yeah. What was that What was that like, uh, uh, raising uh, them? Uh, was, was it smooth sailing, or did you have much drama? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a lot. And now that I'm 50, I think back, and I can't believe I've had five kids. <laughs> yeah. it, it was a lot, yes. <laughs> wow. But, uh, I, you know, but they all grew up, and uh, I mean, they, none of them were uh, uh, smitten down early, and uh, uh, none of them didn't even go to prison. No, no okay. we had some difficulty with our oldest one, you know. But I, he's he's going to have my third grandchild next month. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it looks like he's settling down. Someone listening might think, Luke, are you crazy? I'm what? Are, are, are you rude or something or asking if your children went to prison? But I, I, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is say, okay, if they didn't go to prison and they didn't die young, you know, then, then probably you have a lot to be thankful for, you know, yeah. with, with them. Right. Could, Especially nowadays, you really do, you yeah. know, yeah. The, the trouble they can get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, was you was your would you call yourself then a, a stay at home mother or? And, yeah. Uh, and okay. Uh, yeah. And you're you're, I, you're still busy doing that with a, a twelve year old and an eighteen year old. Yeah, I um I worked in the dental field for a few years, but not too long. My husband is a contractor, and he travels, you know, quite a bit. So we just both decided that. I would be home with the kids, you know, we tried me working for a while, but with that many kids, it's just kind of hard. It really is. So I was blessed that I got to be home with them. You know, I know that's hard now. It really takes two incomes to make it anymore. But yeah, I was pretty blessed back then to yeah. be home with them. It does seem that in um, America now, probably for the last, I'd say, maybe the last 20 or 30 years, the, the norm is that uh, you have two parents working. And before yeah. that, it was very unusual. You, I know my father, um, he worked a lot, but my mother, uh, she never had was employed. She was a mother and she did, you know, yeah. she had her hands full doing that and she did a great job, but you know, that was the norm yeah. back then. Uh, but, but now yeah. uh, for women to get out of the house, it's like they're, so you're almost put on a guilt trip. That, I know. That you're, hey, yeah, you're not really doing anything with your life if you're not uh, getting them in, in the workplace. It's a lot different, you know, than it was 30 years ago, for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I know at, at some point uh, you came to learn about and believe and trust Jesus for your eternal life. 
And uh, I, yeah. uh, uh, that subject hasn't come up yet in our conversation. And, and we reached the age of, of your, uh, your, uh, all your children and uh yeah pretty much currently so uh can you tell me at, at what time and and how did that come about okay yeah sure so we moved to arizona in 1995 and um i was struggling a little bit i had a good marriage but i was struggling with my husband being gone and i think i was struggling a lot with some hurt from my childhood you know, I never really think I got over dealt with my dad being gone a lot. And my mom was married, I want to say five times. And a lot of, you know, and I don't blame her and I forgive her. And she's really come a long way. Um, but she was married five times and those men were abusive. Uh, all except for my dad. So I think, you know, honestly, she just had a void. You know, she had a void in her heart, and she didn't have Jesus. And so she was looking to fill that with men, and they were just not the right men, you know. So I dealt with that, and I just didn't know really how to handle it. So Anyway, long story short, I accepted Christ as my Savior. This was around 1995, and I really felt God, you know. I know some people don't have this epiphany, but I felt like I did. And does that mean you're not saved if you don't? No, it doesn't. But for me personally, that's how I remember the exact day that I came to believing, you know, and I just really felt joy and peace. And um, the problem was, as a new Christian, I was lazy. I wasn't in the Word, and that just threw me off track. <laughs> well, this was about uh, 23 years ago. And, yeah. And, and so uh, can you tell me, uh, in, for example, in, in my case, the only reason I got interested in the Bible and Jesus was because my mother died. And that was this, this the uh, turning point where I needed to get some answers. And I found that's probably true for a lot of people. There's something happens in their life where now they they go to the Bible for some answers. Uh, or they're at least yeah. they're receptive. People have been trying to tell them about Jesus and they didn't want to hear about yeah. it. But now something's changed in life. Now they're receptive. What was going on with right. you at that time, and how did you, did you start I, reading the Bible, or did someone tell you about it? No, I, somebody told me about it, and honestly, I was sitting watching Christian TV, and I know that's not the best place to be hearing the gospel, <laughs> but I believe that God can use anybody, you know, and I was listening to Christian TV, and, you know, I don't remember who it was, but got up there and gave the, the gospel, and I, I, believed you know and that's when i believed on the lord and um after that you know i didn't really have anybody in my life to say well you need to be reading the bible and you know learning and so that kind of really threw me off you know i was just i want to say i was a carnal christian you know didn't get in the word like i should have been and and I think I was just a little frustrated with having three little ones at home and being at home trying to, you know, take care of them. Mm -hmm. And then so I started drinking, you know, and just what I said I would never do what my dad did. And I started drinking a little bit here and there. And the next thing I know is, you know, I got this habit going. And so I really struggled with that. I want to say a good 10 years, you know, and I believe that God just put up with it. You know, he's really patient with me, but it got to a point, and I know you can't always go by dreams, but I had this dream, and I won't get into details, but I had this dream, and, and I believe what the Lord was telling me is, do you want your marriage or do you want to keep going this way? Because if you keep going this way, you're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your marriage. 
Mm. And that woke me up. <laughs> you know? and it, it's like, you know, I didn't have to, he didn't really have to discipline me too much, but yet he was letting me know if you keep doing this, you're going to have big consequences. And I really believe when you're a child of God, you reap what you sow, eventually you're going to have consequences. You know, what is that scripture? The Lord says he disciplines his children. Yeah. He you know, he, he, and he was, he was getting ready. He was disciplining me. Mm-hmm. And um, he was letting me know if you keep going down this road, then you're going to have consequences, you know. So then I decided, I got up the next day and I thought, oh, what am I doing to myself? What am I doing to my family? You know, and I, I was just pretty disgusted with myself. You know, I felt a lot of shame. And, um, you know, but at that point, I really didn't know how I was just going to put it down, you know, because it, it became a habit. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was drinking like a bottle a day, you know, but, you know, it was a habit to where I was like, okay, I think I'll have three glasses of wine tonight. And then maybe tomorrow I'll have four glasses, you Mm -hmm. know? So it was just becoming a really bad habit. And like I told you earlier, my dad was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So I think I was already predisposed to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I really do think there's a generational thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So I remember after that praying to God and I was, I said, God, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. What do I do? And I heard that still small boy say, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I thought, all right, I'm just going to trust you. And so I I tried to put the habit on my own. And I think I struggled with it for a couple of years. And then I just had to really pray and just, you know, pray for strength. And eventually he just took the desire completely away. I have, I don't have any desire to drink now whatsoever. I mean, the, God really did take the desire. I didn't go to AA. Not that I'm saying that's wrong. I don't want to give anybody the impression they shouldn't go to AA. But I think we're all different, and God knew how he was going to have to work with me individually. And so he just began to work with me, and he, he took the desire away. I don't have any desire. I can be around anybody that drinks that doesn't bother me. You know, so, you know, I thank God for that, really. It's just amazing. <laughs> well, you, you said something that I'd like to respond to, and not just for your benefit, but for everybody listening. And that you said that you were a carnal Christian. But, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, we just studied uh, on Wednesday, we studied Romans chapter 7. And Paul yeah. referred to himself. He says, I am carnal. And, uh, yeah. and then he also called the uh, Corinthian church uh, carnal. And he, he said two things about them. He said they're babes in Christ. So they were, they were real Christians, but babes. They haven't matured. And, and yeah. they're now carnal. But I made a video years ago, and the title of it is Carnal Christians in defense of the carnal, the people who are, you know, coming against the carnal Christians. But I made a video titled Carnal Christians that actually makes the point that uh, they say that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian, but I say there's no such thing as a non-carnal Christian. Every yeah. Christian is carnal. And the only thing is, it's only a matter of degrees. We are all, car- we are all carnal from time to time and to varying, varying extents. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know what I want to say is, I have to be careful with my words, but, you know, I do believe there's saved people that are out drinking, you know, that are out partying. That doesn't mean they're not saved. I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. I wouldn't say if you're a new Christian to do that because God is not mocked. <laughs> you know, he will discipline you. But I've also heard a lot of Christians say, well, if you're out living like that, then you're not saved or you're not a Christian, you know, and that really, that bothers me Mm -hmm. because 
now you're saying you're going by how somebody's living and you're deciding if that person, you know, it's almost like you're playing God, really. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I think you have to be careful when, when people are making statements like that because we don't know what God is doing in that person's life. Well, um, we ought to be careful. Is uh, it, that's true, and I think that's probably an understatement. We we ought to be very, very, very careful, uh, be, uh, because everybody is carnal, and if you want to yeah. start, if you want to start pointing out other people's issues, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus talked about it. He said, "Better take the log out of your eye first, <laughs> you know, before that's you start right. looking at all these specks in other people's eyes." But um, that's right. You know, in all the years, and, you know, go ahead. No, stand to stand. You know, it really is. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely been a journey. I would advise if there's any new Christians listening to this, get in the Word. You have to be in the Word. You have to renew your mind daily, and that is something I did not do. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and then. I didn't, I don't think I brought this up, but when I became a believer, I got into the prosperity gospel mm. and that really confused me for years because I was going around listening to people, preachers say, name it and claim it, your best life now, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's when this prosperity started really getting popular back then, you know. And that just caused a lot of uh, confusion in my mind because I knew that I was saved. I, I thought I knew that I knew God and believed on Jesus, but yet my life wasn't turning out. My best life wasn't happening. <laughs> so, so how did all that prosperity fit into the trials? and struggles that Jesus said we would have. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, that caused confusion in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I just didn't know how to handle it, you know? And then, and then also I started listening to a lot of Lordship preachers. And then, then I got scared because I couldn't live up to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, how can I ever live up to being perfect and not sinning? Mm -hmm. And then I just wanted to run from God, you know, and that's what I did. I think yeah. I ran from God for about five years or more. Hmm. So yeah, uh, but, now you're, you, know, uh, uh, you said that uh, you initially um, believed uh, by uh, listening to uh, church on TV. And, and of course, yeah. we know that most of what there is on TV and on the radio is, is not real Christianity, but no. somehow you got the real gospel and then, but then uh, yeah. you continued by uh, using TV as your, for your um, uh, learning. Uh, and uh, then you got prosperity preachers and then you got lordship, lordship preachers. You had a lot of false, uh, uh, the, the prosperity thing, uh, I'm not going to call it false uh, teaching. I, I think that God does want to, does want to bless us. But I also will say that there, there was a young man that came to my home Bible study many years ago for the first time. And the first thing he wanted to do was uh, argue with us about this point that he's saying that uh, we're, we, we should be blessed. We should have an abundance and everything. And he says, uh, he says, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly. And I said, OK, yeah. maybe maybe uh, uh, the the could the abundant life be the abundance of beatings and, and whippings and stonings and shipwreck and everything that Apostle Paul went through? He had an abundance exactly. of persecution and suffering. So exactly. that was that was an abundant life. Abundant doesn't always mean that everything that's a, you know your life is all rosy all the time. I think the prosperity gospel does more damage than you know we can imagine. Because when those things don't happen that you're praying for, then it shipwrecks your faith. Yeah. You know, yeah. Then, then you wonder, does God really love me? You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you? Uh... I mean, yeah, you're right. We are blessed. 
God does bless us. But for me, right now, my blessing is I'm here another day to pray for my family and the people that need me. That's where my blessing is, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a lot of the learning that you were getting was from TV. And we've talked about two things that you get from TV very, very often today is the uh, gos- the prosperity gospel and the lordship uh, heresy. And yeah. at, at some point, did you ever find a, a local congregation or a, a radio program or something that was able to instruct yeah. you that, on the truth? Yes, yes. I, my husband and I go to a good church called Sun Valley, and um, they're, you know, Christ-based, Christ-centered, grace, wonderful church. So we've been going there, I want to say, oh, maybe eight years, maybe not quite that long. So, yeah, we've been going to a good church, and that's really helped. And that really did help me with my thinking and kind of renewing my mind and getting some of, a lot of that false teaching out. Yeah. Well, you know that uh, yeah. in, in our in our congregation, uh, those people who are regularly participating with the Talk and Doctrine programs and the Church of the Eternally Secure programs, uh, all yeah. those regular members, uh, Many of them are thankful, I'm, I'm one of them, that we are able yeah. to have fellowship and study and learn together through this technology, the internet, uh, because there are a lot of places around the country where in an entire town you can't find one good church that's teaching the, the gospel that salvation is a free gift and it's with, it comes with a guarantee. They're, it, they're it, all, is, it's hard to, it really is, it's hard to find. Yeah. I agree, yeah. and and I've just set my mom up to watching your your church on Sundays. I watch it as well, but she's going to be watching, and and I want to say about my mom. Um, you know, she she's had a lot of struggles in life, and I gave her the true gospel, the simple gospel, about two years ago, and she believed in Jesus, and she saved, and. I have really seen a change in her, you know, and I know we can't go by, you know, not everybody's change is the same, but it's really helped her. And I just, uh, I'm so thankful for that. And my dad passed in December and, you know, I was telling you about the Mormonism stuff he grew up around, but two months before, well, two months before, what was that? Uh, your your father, did he ever come to know the truth? Yes, yes. Two months before he passed, I uh, prayed with him. I told him about Jesus. I said, do you believe Jesus died for you? He said, yes, I do. I said, do you want to pray with me? He said, yes, I do. And he's in heaven now sitting with the Lord. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's wonderful. And he, it was two months before he died. He was literally on his deathbed they gave him two weeks to live before he um believed in jesus and i was shocked my dad my dad was very stubborn and um he wasn't going to do anything he wasn't ready for so yeah that that gave me joy uh, really good i'm i'm very happy for you that you uh uh know that your parents uh, uh came to faith and and yes. you, you were instrumental in getting them there. And, and I would have never thought, Brother Luke, I would have never thought I would have been instrumental in doing that. It, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't, if you would have asked me this five years ago, I would have said no. So it was all God. It was all Jesus. <laughs> That's all yeah. I can say. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I, yeah, it was him, but he, he used you. And uh, I uh, I think that if we asked everybody listening now uh, what kind of success have you had uh, uh, telling your friends and family the gospel and having them willing to listen to you and receive it, believe it, uh, it's not very easy. That's why Jesus said it were prophets not recognized or honored in his own town. Because sometimes 
people do not respect us as an authority figure. They, they've known you and, they, and, and they've observed you and they know your faults and they, and they don't respect you as a theologian and who are you to tell them what's the truth and all that. So they, they usually, they need to get it from somebody else rather than their closest family members. Because, and in your case, yeah. uh, they were willing to listen. So that is a wonderful thing. It is. It's wonderful. I just, you know, I, I still have family I got to pray for. And, you know, I do pray for daily. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, uh, your your husband? Uh, you know, he's attends church with you, but uh, yeah. is, is he a be believer? And is and, and how did that come about itself? He he became a believer. I want to say around 2010. So 2008 hit. You know, my husband's a contractor. So when 2008 hit, the economy started falling. The housing, the housing market in Arizona got really bad, which I'm sure it did around Vegas too. And so that whole process really humbled him. And that's when he, I think God really reached him around that time. So mm -hmm. we, we really struggled for, I want to say a good five years. You know, we lost our cars. We come real close to losing our house. I think we were about a day away from our house going into auction. So we weren't living from month to month. We weren't living from day to day mm -hmm. for a good maybe three to five years. So that was a struggle. So that really humbled him. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, 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 Brother Leon, let me say that he, he uh, may have typed in all caps to get my attention that the sound was going to, because it sounded like wind was blowing on my microphone and it's true wind was blowing on the microphone brother it was i had my fan turned on because i'm getting these my doctor told me the other day that i have andropause <laughs> i never knew there was such a thing but it's like menopause but men get it i get hot flashes all the time now it's just horrible but uh so i can relate to you women suffering with that now but uh I turned the yeah. fan off, and they say that the, the audio is is better now that I turned the fan off. Okay, uh, <laughs> so your your husband, uh, you think that he was humbled uh, with the uh, financial difficulties, and uh, yeah. did he? Uh, were you able to talk to him uh, the way you talked to your parents? Uh, uh, and, and no. Well, you know, my husband's pretty stubborn, <laughs> but he did, you know, I, I I believe he's heard a lot from me about Jesus and God and spirituality, so I don't know how much he actually listened, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, you know, God uses all things, and I believe that this was what God was going to use to get to him, you mm -hmm. know, to draw my husband to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, if I'm thankful for going through what we went through, 2008, the you know the whole housing crash and everything, yeah. it would probably be for my husband. Yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, uh, when you uh, you've been going to the church for what do you say, three years or eight years now? I can't remember. Oh, I would say probably a good eight years. Uh, yeah. And, and, and what was the I, impetus? Uh, that made you go to that a church? In, 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 did you try other well, churches out, or was that did you find a, a good one right off the bat? No, you know I found a good one, but I had my friend, my neighbor. Our girls grew up together, and I knew her for quite a number of years because I we lived in the same house for twenty years. So anyway, long story short, she told me about Sun Valley. So I went to Sun Valley with her, and then my husband and I started going, and we just mm -hmm. stayed there. You didn't have to twist his arm, though, initially to get him to go then. He was Well, no, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there was a while where he didn't go. I just I went without him, but he eventually tagged along. And, you know, I, I've i told him a few times, look, if you, I don't want to make you go, you know, so if you don't want to go, just let me know. And he's been going with me since, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, that that scenario is 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 probably the majority. I mean, you know, we usually if one spouse gets saved, and there's usually a lag 
if the other one gets saved, there's a lag, a period of time where one one saved, the other is not. And uh, they uh, they usually you have to practice your faith. You know, go to church and do your whatever you're doing in your faith. You, you need you do that by yourself for a while before the the, the spouse ends up uh, joining. And uh, but um, so that's good. Uh, now, what about your uh, your children living at home? I assume you've instructed them in the Lord and, and uh, told them the gospel. And well, everything. no. See, during this time when they were younger is when I was in the drinking thing, and I wasn't living a good example. You mm -hmm. know, even though I did have them in church, you know, I still had them in church and. You know, they were around that, but not as much as they should have been. So I, I'm struggling with that now. You know, um, I'm praying for them. Mm -hmm. I don't, as far as their salvation goes, I'm not sure. You know, my daughter, I've talked to her a lot about it because she's still home. And my son, who's 12, he just loves Jesus. He was about 10, and he, he just come up to me one day and he said, Mom, I believe in Jesus and I love him. And you know, I prayed with him and he's always the one in the family that wants to pray at dinner and wants to, you mm -hmm. know, read. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Yeah, but. Yeah, that is good. And uh, um, the older one, though, it, when, once they start going into particularly high school and then if they go off to college, uh, it can really mess them up. But uh, they they start yeah. getting that uh, secular education with the Darwinism and uh, the scoffing at uh, any kind of religious faith. Uh, they start uh, believing uh, in science instead of uh, you know the, the Bible, and and they can develop that kind right. of attitude. Uh, uh, sometimes it's it's really really tough to uh, ever yeah. um, persuade them at that after that happens. But uh, uh, yeah, the you're older. Uh, yeah. Then, Go ahead. Right. And I just, this is where I have to have faith and just, you know, continue to give it to God and pray mm -hmm. for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I think the most important thing that we need to do with uh, everybody, uh, whether it's your parents, as you did, or your children or your friends or your family or anybody is we just give them the most simple, basic gospel message to, to let, the, let them know that, look, you don't have to become a theologian uh, yeah. you know, to, to uh, uh, have your place in heaven guaranteed to you. It's not required that you become a theologian, but you do need to uh, believe the, these basic things. And, and, uh, yeah. and that is that you, you need to come to the conclusion that you, in fact, are guaranteed eternal life in, in heaven by Jesus. And when you believe that you are guaranteed, that you are going to go there only because of what Jesus did for you, then it becomes a reality. But it's it's, it's a pipe dream until you actually believe it. Then it, that's what makes it true. By believing is what makes it true for you. So uh, yeah. well, now once we tell them that and we, we get a person to understand that, it's out of our hands. We, we There's nothing we can do. They will either believe it or not. And they'll develop an interest in pursuing it further or not. But, you know, all we can do then after that point is at least know, as Paul, so Paul said, and he wiped his hands and said, uh, my, there's no blood on my hands when he's. That's he, right. Yeah, at least we did our part and told them. And, uh, you know, many people, yeah. they they take on such a burden on themselves thinking it's their, their responsibility to get someone saved, especially the ones we love so much. I know. It, it is hard, you know, when when it's your kids and you worry about them. I agree. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and then how did you come about uh, getting on the Internet and uh, finding this uh, these Internet, uh, well, uh, Christian Internet uh, YouTube channels? Well, I started, you know, when I was really struggling and struggling with God. I started watching Jack Smack, and that really started getting my thinking clear and realizing that I was saved by grace, and I started having joy again, and I started having peace. 
mm. and security. And then I started, you know, I stumbled on Renee's show, on her videos, and I started watching Renee, and I started learning, and then I started watching you, and so now I just feel I'm really excited about the gospel, because I'm learning, and I'm really, you know, trying. I don't want to be a carnal Christian anymore, you know, I want to grow. Yeah. I want to grow as a Christian, so mm. I've really... I'm making, you know, efforts, hmm. but I know I'm not saved by work. I know it's grace now, and that's what's really given me peace of mind. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You you mentioned uh, Brother Jack Smack. Uh, he is my longest lasting uh, friendship uh, among all, oh. the, all the YouTube believers. I yeah. did not know uh, that. He, wow. He, he, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been on YouTube for about 10 years. And we've been friends for just about that entire length of time. And I've had a lot of other friends over the years, but, uh, but a lot of those friendships have gone by the wayside because people are so intolerant uh, when you disagree on something. They, there's yeah. zero tolerance for di di disagreeing with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Brother Jack Smack I... is really, he, he has a way. Not only does he... Um, uh, defend the gospel and the, the person of Jesus uh, as well as anybody and it directly and simply and it's clearly uh, but yeah. a particular type of personality the way he does it, it a person will either uh, be intrigued by that and unlike his style of communicating or there's some people that they can't stand stand it just because of his, his they object to his personality or something you know but uh, many people I found are have been really uh, blessed by his ministry, and and then Renee. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, there's hardly a day that goes by that I'm not getting a message from somebody saying I found out about you from uh, from Renee, and this, then they tell me about how they didn't know the real gospel until Renee, and it just it happens over and over and over again. So. Uh, yeah. Yes, I've definitely been blessed by Renee and Jack Smack and you. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, now, uh, you're uh, you're participating. Uh, I mean, I see you in the in the chat room doing a lot of the, a lot of our programs, and yeah. uh, I know that you're uh, you're listening and you're commenting, and uh, so that's how we got to to know you. Uh, and the, the Paul says that the, the church is the, a body, like a body and it has many parts and every part plays a different role in the body and how do you see your role what part of the body of the church do you see yourself you know I'm not sure <laughs> you know I've really been questioning that I, I feel I'm good at encouraging people um you know, and there's a little bit of my story that I wanted to bring up. I don't know if we have time, yeah, but, sure, um, ahead. well, tell you, tell you my time. son, so, so our youngest is 12. Well, we became pregnant. It was about three months into the pregnancy. I, everything looked good. You know, we seen the heartbeat and then, uh, I started having pains and then we went to the doctor and they said that, you know, I had miscarried and that. They, they couldn't get the heartbeat, so the the doctor, my doctor sent me home and basically told me, you're going to have to deliver stillborn. So that was horrible. I mean, I was just heartbroken. And so this was on a Friday, and they had scheduled me for a DNC for surgery on a Monday. So... Women probably, that's just to make sure after you lose a child, you're in pregnancy, you don't get an infection. Mm -hmm. So anyway, long story short, I go back home and I'm trying to get ready for the surgery the following Monday. And my mom looked at me and she said, you're still pregnant. And I said, well, how can you say that? Don't say that to me. I lost the baby, mom. And she said, well, I can't help it. You're still pregnant. So I called my doctor and I said, well, you know, I told him my mom said, and my doctor said, well, if it's, you lost the baby, but if it's going to reassure you before the surgery, 
come in tomorrow and we'll do another ultrasound. So my husband and I went in, we're sitting there, and the nurse is doing the ultrasound, and she looks at me, and she looks at him, and she had this glare on her face. And she said, let me go run and get the doctor. And so we're looking at each other, what is wrong with her? And she, so the doctor comes back in, and he does the ultrasound, and he says, oh, this baby is viable. Oh. And I'm like, what do you mean this baby's viable? And he said, well, this is a twin. He said, you lost baby B, but baby A is still viable. Wow. And my husband and I look at each other in shock. Wow. You know, we didn't know what to think. We were confused because here they were a day earlier telling us that we had lost the baby and they were scheduling surgery sent us home, and now they're telling us that, oh, you have a twin that's still viable. So we're, we said to the doctor, well, what does that mean? And he said, basically, this baby may make it, but the chances are very slim. I think they gave us like a 10% chance. So he said, I'm going to send you home, put you on bed rest. And then I'll see you back, like, next week. And then they sent us to specialists. So, long story short, every week that went by that I didn't lose the baby was a greater risk that this baby would survive. So, once I made it to about 18 weeks, they took me off of bed rest. So, at that point, I was at about four and a half months. So they took me off of bed rest. The baby looked good. They gave me the okay to go off of bed rest. I thought the problems were over. No, it just started. <laughs> so then everything was great. Then at about right before I hit 20 weeks, so this was about five months, my water ruptured. Now, women know when your water ruptures, you know the baby has to have amniotic fluid to survive. So when I went to the doctor and he said, this is the worst thing that could have happened to you, you have ruptured. And I was five months. So he told me, go home, you're going to deliver a stillborn. So just be ready. I was absolutely horrified. I got in the car and I was screaming at God. And I said, if I can't have this baby, you can't have me. And I was mad. I said, God, you put me through this. Now I have to lose this twin too. I was really upset. I wasn't happy with God, and like I had a choice whether he could have me or not, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I went home, and uh, I had decided I wasn't going to lose this baby. I didn't care if I had to stand on my head. I was not going to have a stillborn. I wasn't going to lose my baby because I had already gone through so much. You know, and I didn't tell you this, but prior, a few years before that, I had three miscarriages. So I'd, I had already experienced loss, even though I had other children. Loss is loss, you know. When you lose a baby, whether in vitro or you, or you lose the loss of a child, it, it's heartbreaking. And so I just want to say if there's anybody listening that you've experienced loss, you know, don't give up hope. Because I know, I know what that's like, and there's always hope. But anyway, long story short, I went home at five months. I went on bed rest, and I really fought. I fought hard. And I made it to six months. I made it to 24 weeks. At that point, they decided to put me in the hospital downtown Phoenix. And I was excited. I thought, well, I made it to 24 weeks. I'm going in the hospital, and I knew when I went in there, I was going to be in there until I had the baby. And so I had three specialists over my care. 
and they were great. I was in one of the best hospitals in the country for high-risk pregnancies. So once I got in there, they found other problems that I didn't know I had. You know, I thought I was in the clear. But once I get a, got in the hospital, they found other problems. So to make a long story short, basically, it didn't look good. They didn't know if they were going to be able to save the baby. They didn't know if they were going to be able to save me. Um, what had happened is I had, pri I had a prior C-section. And the scar tissue had grown around my uterus from the previous C-section and it attached around the uterus. So basically they were afraid that I was going to hemorrhage and that the baby would not would be born too early and that he wouldn't make it. So the goal was with the three surgeons, the three doctors, they were going to try to get me to 35 weeks. So I was in there at 24 weeks. The goal was to get me to 35. Well, at about 31 weeks, I went into, um, I had to have an emergency speak section. I had went into E. coli, I got septic, so I contacted infection. And then the baby had it. So they had to do an emergency C-section. They got the baby out. They had to resuscitate him twice. His blood pressure wasn't stabilizing. They had did not think he would make it through the night. And then I'm in surgery for about seven hours. So then they're telling my husband they didn't think I would make it through the night. So here my, my poor husband thought that he was going to lose our baby and then thought he may lose me. And it, it was just, uh, it was terrifying for him, you know. But so when all this was going on, my my husband had called my neighbor, and she was a Christian. And he said, can you come down here? I need you to pray. And her and another good friend of mine, Robin, they both started praying. And I believe she contacted the church. So I had the church praying for us. I had a couple of, you know, friends praying for us. And I made it. I woke up. I made it through surgery. And the surgeon came out and told my husband he said, well, we didn't think she'd make it, but we got her through. And then my son, it wasn't looking good. You know, they were trying to get me in there to see him because they didn't, they wanted me to see him in case he didn't make it through the day. And I had just come out of seven hour surgery. So they were trying to work on getting me down there to see him. But they said after they got me down there that, and I, went in and touched his hand that his blood pressure came up and he started improving. So the end of the story is, you know, we both made it and, you know, it's, I do believe in miracles. And, you know, the thing is God could have chose to heal me immediately. You know, he could have chose to heal me when I started having problems, but I think he, it was, everything was for a reason, you know, he wanted it to be about him. Jesus wanted it to be, look what I did. You know, give me the glory. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty amazing. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to been through. No, it was the hardest thing I ever have been through. But, you know, I would do it again because I have my son and he's a believer and he's just been such a blessing. He's had, you know, he's on the autism spectrum, so he's had some challenges. But he's came through a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say if anybody's struggling with anything, you know, don't give up. Whether it's a loss or an illness, you know. Mm -hmm. well, God's with you. Yeah, your, your story started with my question. Is, what, what is your part in the body of Christ? How do you see it? And you said that you uh, like to encourage and I will say that um, this is probably one of the most um, unrecognized, unhonored uh, calling that is so important to all of us and those who are the encouragers. And uh, yeah. don't, if you are someone who is, uh, you, you are called to, to encourage others and you know who you are, 
uh, I want you to know how valuable you are. And, you know, Paul talked yeah. about how that the, we have these different gifts and some, some of the gifts are more, uh, seem to be more honored and, than the others, but we really should be honoring the, the, the gifts that don't get much recognition. I forget exactly how he's phrased, but the, the, the gifts that people kind of take for granted and don't have to get all the attention or all the recognition, like the encourager, um, yeah. we need to appreciate uh you and, and the, the people who uh, are the encouragers and but i do have a couple of questions about this uh, this experience uh, two questions uh what about the twin and also what about your mother how did she know <laughs> to say such a thing to you you know all i can say is it was the holy spirit <laughs> brother luke because she had no way of knowing she had no way of knowing. I went. To, I was in the grocery store with her, and she just looked at me and said, "You're still pregnant." And at the time, I thought, "Well, that's a horrible thing to say to me because they just told me I lost the baby." <laughs> yeah. How how could she have known? And she she uh, she wasn't just saying, "Hey, there's there there's a possibility." Don't you think there's a possibility? No, she was seemed to be like absolute. It's absolute. You're still pregnant. How would she know it? Yes. Yes. It was God. It was God. You know, it was the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. coming through. You're not mm -hmm. going to lose this baby, and I'm putting a stop to it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because at that point, if I had went in for the surgery, you know, I don't know what would have happened. You know, I don't know if they would have done another ultrasound to make sure. I who's to say? You know, but he was, you know, our little guy. He's 12 now, and actually, this happened 12 years ago Sunday, this coming Sunday, the 27th, so he was meant to be here. But, you know, another thing I want to say is prayer, you know, prayer is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, it seemed like the last couple of days, uh, many more prayer requests have come to my attention. I'm sure that everybody listening now and they're in the chat room here, you're probably aware that there's a lot of people yeah. in need of our prayers right now. And uh, I'll tell you what I always do when I pray is um, I ask the Lord, Lord, you are such a great God. I don't just answer the prayer in some little mild mannered way that's, you know, okay, you fix the problem. Do it in a dramatic way right. so, so right. that there is no possible conclusion that anybody could draw except this is a miracle from Jesus. Right. I want yeah. Jesus to get all the glory. Yeah. So do it, do it, give us a dramatic answer the prayer you know, dramatically, Lord. You know, and the other thing too is yes, he did answer prayer and he he did spare our lives, you know, my son and I, but we had to go through the struggle. You know, and I, I just think that a lot of times we don't recognize the struggle. We don't recognize that it's God. You know, he's using that struggle for a purpose. You know, we don't, we don't, we always want to see him heal, but we don't want to see him when we're going through the struggle. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Do you understand? You know, I still had to go through the struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, he did. It was a miracle because even the doctors can't explain how we made it through. So it was a miracle, but I still had to go through the struggle. You mm -hmm. know, I want to do a, yeah. I want to do a special uh, program some night soon uh, and have a, uh, anybody who has experienced some fantastic miracle. Uh, that, oh, that would be that, amazing. And then we can all sh share our, our miraculous uh, stories. And I made a video, uh, Signs and Wonders is the title. And I talk about, yeah. I think about maybe five miracles in my life that, and these are things that are, there is no other way it could be explained except that it's, it's a miracle from Jesus. Uh, we, uh, there, that's what I like about yeah. these things is that they can't be, uh, well, uh, you know, it's possible uh, that uh, there's some other explanation. Uh, 
Um, maybe it's God, maybe not. No, these are things that there, there's no possibility that it could be anything yeah. except God. That's what those are the ones I really like. And uh, I've had it happen many times, and I know that other people have. And we we're going to have a program here. So get your get your miracles lined yeah. up and get them ready. I, I had I don't know. I just came to me now, but we do need to do a program on that. Someone asked, well, who who do we need to pray for tonight? I'll tell you. There's two brothers right now. Um, uh, brother Alex, and then there's another brother, but I don't remember his name, but uh, uh, that they may be losing their home. And, and, okay. and there's also uh, Anna, She's she was in the ER uh, all night. And uh, okay. and there's others too. Those are the those are two that come to mind, but there's several others. But uh, I, I if you can't if you don't know exactly, just say, Lord, uh, all those people who have asked for our prayers, help, say yes, help them. Okay? And the Lord knows their names. Yeah. The Lord knows their situation. We don't have to be aware of all the details. Just uh, Right. Yeah. Because God knows, definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Okay. Um, well, I think we, we got up to the, uh, the, the present uh, time of your life. And is there anything in your life um, that you know, maybe we uh, we should go back and because uh, I skipped over it or anything you want to elaborate further? Uh, well, I think we've covered everything. I'm trying to think now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not, yeah, you know, I think that's pretty much been my history. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, then. Uh, for those of you who... Uh, if you've been uh, listening to and watching these, uh, all these interviews I've been doing, uh, uh, you understand, you know, why I'm doing them. But if you're, if you're new here and you're, someone asked her, what's the subject or the topic tonight? And uh, someone said, well, it's an interview. If you're, if you're wondering why we're doing these is because I think it's important, at least if for nobody else's benefit, for my benefit, I get to the chance to get to know each one of you better. Uh, by conducting the interview. And I'm sure that many other people in the congregation are being blessed by these interviews because uh, if we get to know each other better, our fellowship is, is closer. Yeah. And so uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, you uh, volunteered your time tonight to, uh, to share the details of your oh, life with us. It's been an honor, Brother Lou. All right, let me ask uh, the chat room before we say good night here. Um, oh, Anna says, I will be having an endoscopy Monday. They moved it sooner due to the extreme pain. So oh, I'll pray Anna. for her tonight. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so, uh, in the chat room, if there's any question or any comment that you want to make right now before we close for the night that uh, you would like us to respond to, go ahead and do it. Make it now uh, because we'll be finishing up very, very quickly here. Uh, I see. Uh, someone's saying Renee. It's not Sister Renee here, but uh, whoever you are, it says Renee. Oh, Anna, I will pray for you. Uh, I don't think that's Sister Renee Rowland, but if uh, if that's not, uh, hello Renee, you you have the same name as one of our beloved sisters here, and so uh, uh, if it's your first time with us, uh, welcome. By the way, yeah. um, by the way, uh, um, my channel is Sin City Preacher. I, I host uh, three programs each week for the Church of the Eternally Secure. That's the name of our congregation. And uh, we have these interviews on Friday nights. We have a Wednesday night Bible study at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we have a Sunday church service at 5 p.m. Eastern. So um, I, I hope that you'll, if tonight was an experience that you, uh, you enjoyed and see there's some value in it, then I, I, I invite you to join us for all of these uh, occasions. And uh, I, I hope that uh, this experience tonight, you, you were, felt welcome. Um, all right, let's see if there's anything it's in here. Uh, uh, well, um, I don't see any, any final questions for you, sister. Uh, 
So uh, okay. I guess that, I guess that uh, we've covered everything, and I'll just uh, thank you again and uh, to everybody thank in the chat room. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Brother Luke. Yeah. And bye, everyone. I feel like I got to know your family uh, uh, better tonight too. So uh, yes, say, you did. Say hello to them <laughs> for me, and uh, tell, them all, tell them all tell them all blessings in the name of our great Savior God Jesus. Okay. Blessings to you as well. All right then. Okay. Okay. Good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. All right. Good night. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, I don't have anybody scheduled for next Friday. So um, whoever is interested and available, contact me and I will schedule an interview for you. Uh, my email is sincitypreacher at gmail.com. Thank you and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.